Nazi Germany. They decided to prove me right. They shut us down. Only then did we become radical. Isn't that the way it is? Our final issue of Zeitung had a huge headline in red ink. Revolt. That annoyed the authorities. They ordered me out of the Rhineland. So we went to Paris. Where else do exiles go? Where else can you stay up all night and drink wine in a cafe and tell lies about how revolutionary you were in the old country? If you're going to be an exile, be one in Paris. Paris was our honeymoon. Jenny found a tiny flat in the Latin Quarter. Head of the ones. Soon the word was out from the German police to the Paris police. It seems the police develop an internationalist consciousness long before the work. <coughs> so we were expelled, went to Belgium, expelled again, and then we came to London, where the political refugees come from all over the world. The British are admirable in their tolerance and insufferable in their boasting about it. Sentence of English without butchering it. English is a beautiful language. It is Shakespeare's language. If Shakespeare and her keeper speak one sentence of English, he would have taken poison. Jenny felt sorry for him. She used to like to invite him to our family dinners. One evening he came over and he announced the formation of the Marxist Society of London. A, a Marxist Society, and I asked. Um, <laughs> What's that? He said, we meet every week to discuss another of your writings. We read aloud and examine sentence by sentence. That's why we call ourselves Marxists. We believe completely and wholeheartedly in everything you've ever written. <laughs> completely and wholeheartedly, I am. Yes. And we would be honored, Herr Dr. Marx. He was going to Dr. Marx. If you would address the next meeting of the Marxist Society, I cannot do that. Why not? Because I am not a Marxist. <laughs> I didn't mind his bad English. Mine wasn't always so perfect. It was his way of thinking. He was an embarrassment. A settlement. Encircling my words, reflecting them to the world, but distorting them. And then defending the distortions like a fanatic. Denouncing anyone who interpreted them differently. I said, Jenny, do you know what I fear most? She said that the workers' revolution will never come. I said, no. That the revolution will come, but what it does is be taken over by men like people. Flatterers went out of power. Believers and braggarts went over the power. Dog. They will speak for the proletariat. They will interpret my ideas for the world. They will organize a new hierarchy and priesthood, and excommunications and indexes, inquisitions and firing squads, all this in the name of communism. They'll divide the world between capitalist empires and communist empires. They'll muck up our beautiful dream. And it will take another revolution, maybe two or three, to clean it up. That's what I hear. No. I was not going to have Peeper translate Das Kapital. Represented him. 
15 years of work in the conditions of so making my way every morning past the bodies of beggars snooping amidst the sewage to the British Museum. There is a magnificent library working into the reading. Reading. Is there anything more boring than reading political economy? Writing political economy. Then home through the darkening streets, past the vendors calling out the prices of their wares. Veterans of the Crimean War, some blind, others without legs, begging for pen, the postman. Some of my critics, trying to minimize what went into the dust cotton town, would say, as they always say about radical writers, oh, he must have had some dreadful personal experience. Yes! If you want to make much of it, then walk home through Soho, feel the anger that went into dust cotton town. But I hear you saying, well, of course, that was then, over a century ago. Only then, on my way here this morning, I walked through the streets of your city, surrounded by garbage, breathing foul air, past the bodies of men and women sleeping on the street, huddled against the cold. Instead of a lassie singing a ballad, I heard a voice in my ear, some change, sir, for a cup of coffee. Do you call this progress? Because you have motor cars, flying machines, a thousand potions to make you smell better. And people sleeping on the street. An official report. Last year, the United States gross domestic product, yes, gross, <laughs> was $7,000 billion. Most really impressive. Tell me, where is it? Who is profiting from it? Who is not? Less than 500 individuals control $2,000 billion in business assets. Are these individuals more noble, more hardworking, more valuable to society than the mother and the tenant, nursing three children in the winter without any money to pay the heating bill? Didn't you hear me say 160 years ago that capitalism would greatly increase the wealth of the world, but that that wealth would be concentrated into fewer and fewer hands? Goldman Sachs. I'll say the one. <laughs> um, do you know the, uh, the Oliver Goldsmith poem, um, The Deserted Village? Ill fares the land to hastening ills of prey, where wealth accumulates and men decay. That's what I saw as I walked through the streets of your city. Buildings decay, schools decay, people decay. But then I walked a bit farther, and I was suddenly surrounded by men of obvious wealth, women in jewels and furs. Suddenly I heard the sound of sirens. Was a crime being committed somewhere nearby? Was violence being done? Was somebody trying to take a part of the gross domestic product <gasps> illegally from those who had stolen it legally? <laughs> ah, the wonders of the market system! Human beings reduced to commodities, their lives controlled by the super commodity, money! The committee doesn't like that. <laughs> um, in that little flat on Dean Street, we had hot soup and boiled potatoes. Fresh bread from our friend the baker down the street. We'd sit around the dinner table and discuss the latest events of the day, the Irish struggle for freedom. 
latest war. The stupidity of the country's leader, the political opposition, confining itself to pips and squeeze. The cowardly press. I suppose things are different these days. After dinner, we would clear the table and I would work. With a glass of beer, my cigars handy, with guest work, till three or four in the morning. Books piled up on one side, parliamentary reports piled up on the other. And across the table, Jenny was transcribing. My handwriting was impossible. She <laughs> rewrote every word I wrote. Can you imagine a more heroic act? Occasionally a crisis. Not a world crisis, a book would be missing. I said to Jenny, uh, have you seen my Ricardo? She said, you mean uh, principles of political conflict? She thought I was finished with it. She had taken it to a pawn shop. I lost my temper. My Ricardo, you pawned my Ricardo? She said, be quiet. Just last week, didn't we pawn the ring my mother gave me? <laughs> That's how it was. We pawned everything, especially gifts from Jenny's family. And when we were finished with those, we found our clothes. One winter, you know the London man. I went without my overcoat. Another time I walked outside, my feet began to freeze in the snow. And then I realized I'm not wearing shoes. We bought them the day before. When Capital was published, we celebrated with a big dinner plan. Angles had to give us some money so we could retrieve our linens and dishes from the pawn shop. Angles. The same. There's no other word for it. Whenever the water was cut off, the gas was cut off, the house was dark, our spirits low. Angles paid the bill. His family owned factories in Manchester. Yes, capitalism saved us. But he did not always understand our needs. Uh, we had no money for groceries, and he would show up with crates of wine. One Christmas, we had no means to afford a buying spot. A Christmas tree. Angles shows up with six bottles of champagne. So we imagined a tree, formed a circle around it, drank champagne, and sang Christmas songs. Now, I know what my revolutionary friends were thinking. Marx, the atheist, a Christmas tree. It's true. I did say that religion is the opium of the people. But no one has ever paid attention to the full passage. Religion is the side of the oppressed creature. It is the heart in a heartless world. The soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. True, opium may not be a solution. Sometimes it is necessary to relieve pain. Don't I know that? From my boils. Isn't the world a terrible case of the boils? I keep thinking about Jenny. How she loaded up all of our possessions. Carried our children across the channel to London. And then gave her three times. In that miserable flat on Dean Street. Nurse those babies and try to keep them warm. But saw them die. One by one. Guido. He had he had not even begun to walk. Francesca. She was one year old. I had to borrow three pounds to pay for her coffin. Uh, Moosh. Moosh lived almost eight years. Something went wrong from the start. Uh, he had a large, handsome head. The rest of him never grew. The night he died, we all slept around his body on the floor. So when uh, Eleanor was born, we were fearful. She was a tough little thing. She was fortunate to have two older sisters, Genishin and Laura. They were lucky to survive themselves. Genishin, our first, was born in Paris. Paris, he is marvelous for lovers, miserable for children. Something about the air. Laura, our second, was born in Brussels. No one should be born in Brussels. Yeah. 
In Paris, we had no money, but we always had family picnics and walk a mile and a half into the countryside, Jenison, Laura, Luncheon. Um, I'll tell you about Luncheon. Luncheon would make a roast veal. We would have tea and cheese and fruit bread and beer. Eleanor was the youngest, but she drank beer. No money. Let children need a vacation. One time, the groceries money, I sent them to the Atlantic Coast of France. Another time, with the red money, I, I, I bought a piano. Um, because the girls love music. Now, a father is not supposed to have favorites among his children, but Eleanor. I used to say, Jenny, Eleanor is a strange child. She would say, do you expect the children of Karl Marx to be normal? <laughs> Eleanor was the youngest, the brightest. Imagine a revolutionary at age eight. That's how old she was in 1863. Poland was in rebellion against Russian rule. And Tussie, um, that's what we call her, Tussie, wrote a letter to Engels about those brave little fellows in Poland, as she called them. When she was nine, she wrote a letter to America, advice to President Lincoln on how to win the war against the Confederacy. Also, she smoked and she drank. Still, she was a little child dressing up a little doll, but she would one of us and why. I played chess with her when she was 10, and I could not easily defeat her. When she was 14, when she was 14, she became enraged at the law of observing the Lord's Day. No activity was permitted on Sunday. So she organized Sunday evenings for the people. St. Martin's Hall. She brought their musicians to play Handel, Mozart, Beethoven. The hall was packed. 2,000 people. It was completely illegal. And yet, no one was arrested. A lesson. You're going to do something illegal. Do the 2,000 people. <laughs> and uh, Mozart. I used to read Shakespeare and Aeschylus and Dante aloud to her and her sister, which she loved. Her room was a Shakespeare museum. She memorized Romeo and Juliet and insisted that I recite over and over again those lines when Romeo sees Juliet for the first time. The brightness of her cheek would shame those stars as daylight off a lamp. Her eyes in heaven would, through the air region, stream so bright that birds would sing and think it were not now. She was not always easy to live with. Oh no. Do you know how embarrassing it is to have a child who finds flaws in your reasoning? She loved to argue with me about my writing. For instance, my essay on the Jewish way. Difficult to understand, I admit. Eleanor read it and immediately challenged me. She said, why are you singling out Jews as representatives of capitalism? They're not the only ones poisoned by commerce and greed. I said, I'm not singling out the Jews. I'm really using them as a vivid example. In response, she began to wear a Jewish star. I'm a Jew, she announced. What could I say? I shrugged my shoulders. She said, that's a very Jewish gesture. <laughs> she could be very annoying. <laughs> she knew that my father had converted to Christianity. So it wasn't convenient to be a Jew in Germany. Is it ever convenient to be a Jew anywhere? She also knew I had been baptized, the fact that she treated her. She once asked me, more. The family called me more because my daughter flesh. She said, More, I know you were baptized. The first were circumcised, weren't you? Don't be embarrassed, that girl. At such time she was impossible, for instance, alongside her Jewish star, she began to wear a crucifix. Not because she was an elder Christian, but of their theology and their struggle against British rule. She learned all about it from Lizzie Burns. Angles love. Now, Lizzie was a mill girl and could not read. Angles spoke nine languages. You would think this would make it difficult for the ethnic community, but they were love. Lizzie was very involved in the Irish struggle. Eleanor would visit all the time. The two of them would stay up all night and drink wine and sing Irish songs until they both fell asleep on the floor. There was that time, though. That terrible time. They hang two young Irishmen right there at Soho with a drunken crowd cheering. Those genteel English with their afternoon tea and their public hangings. I understand you don't do that anymore. 
Okay. Gas people. Inject pool. Okay, I'm just a closing part of it because I think it's 10 to 30 already. Uh, uh, sit here. Uh, you get a, a glimpse of Mark's life. I mean, he lived very poorly. I mean, the kids, his children dies, three of them, I think, died when he was. Uh, London, so they, they couldn't afford even to actually buy the coffins. And these are these are based on actual stuff here. These are based on historical writings, based on the letters that he wrote, angles, a memoir that uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, somehow wrote, uh, and the kids, uh, Eleanor, Eleanor, Eleanor. Uh, she died young as well, actually, uh, despite being a, the brightest uh, kids of Karl Marx. She died young, committing suicide. Uh, because of uh, certain things, I don't know what happened, but she, she commits suicide. So, so Marx lived in poverty, and somehow he, he sees poverty uh, around himself. That's why I think he wrote the Das Kapitalism as well. Um, so, uh, and he's, he's a family man in the sense that he he had only one wife, and stayed with one wife till the end. There's a kind of a scandal going on in the family as well. He didn't have uh, an affair. Sorry? He didn't have an affair. A scandal, uh, a scandal. Uh, no, it's, it's not. Uh, it's, it's a bit of history. If you look at the Love and Capital books, somebody would say she would. Have, the author would argue, yeah, she had an affair with Lynchin. You know the word Lynchin just now. Come up, come up. It's one of the myths. It's the myths. One. It's the only myth that uh, uh, it's it's following the family. You know, it's following the Jenny's family, the Jenny side of the family. So the Lynch was the Lynch, the Lynch, Lynch uh, was being said by Jenny's family. Jennifer's family was very rich, but they were being cut off from the wealth. Uh, she was being cut off from the wealth because marrying uh, Marx, uh, in a way. So um, this is the the the, the, the biographical, biographical side of Marx. I don't know whether we're gonna we're gonna play this till the end or I don't know. But ten thirty, I think I should just do a closing with Marx. So next week we're gonna actually look at the crisis. This is the more interesting part. This is something that's quite useful for you to look at what's happening in our economy today whether Marx get it right or get it wrong. And the next classes, we're going to discuss about the criticisms to Marx and Ricardo at the same time. Um, so hopefully see you next week. Um, thank you very much for the organizers. I ended here. Salam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.